Hello, and thank you everyone for joining this webinar with alumni and McGill professor, Dr. Joe Schwartz, who is a director of McGill Office for Science and Society. An award-winning educator and, and science presenter, he is well known for his informative and entertaining public lectures on topics ranging from the chemistry of love to the science of aging. Today, Dr. Joe will be sharing how to spot nonsense disguised as science. Before we get started, I'd like to mention that you could submit your questions using the chat box feature on your sidebar, and we'll be answering your questions at the end. I'll now turn it over to you, Dr. Joe. Thanks very much. It was a dark and stormy night. Hey, it really was. And there was a knock on my door. I opened the door, and standing there was a salesman. He looked kind of sloppy and haggard. I had pity on him. And he asked if he could come in, and I said, sure, come on in. I didn't know what on earth he was selling. He said, can we sit down in your kitchen? Sure. So we sit down in my kitchen, and he looks over at the water tap. Then he looks at me, and he says, sir, tell me, is this what you drink? Well, I sheepishly admitted, yes, this is exactly what we drink. We even give it to the dog. He doesn't seem to mind. Uh, but this gentleman seemed to be perturbed by this. And uh, he went on to ask me another question. He said, do you know that there are chemicals in your water? Mm. Well, I didn't know exactly where this was heading, but I thought that perhaps it was a bit too early to suggest that he had knocked on the wrong door because I could sniff something delicious possibly emerging out of this. So I said, what do you mean? Do you mean the water molecules? He says, no, 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 no. I mean the invisible pollutants that are in your water that you can't see. <clears throat> Can I see them? I asked. And he says, sure, let me show you. So he takes a glass of water from my tap and he digs into his briefcase and he takes out this contraption, two electrodes attached to a battery. He immerses the electrodes in the water. We wait about 30 seconds, the water gets yellowish, cloudy, and about a minute later, it is looking pretty disgusting. Then he picks it up, has a look into it, and says, this is what you were drinking. The message was clear. There were these awful toxins hiding in the water until they had been scared out of solution by passing an electric current through there. Well, by now, I saw what was happening here. I knew that the scum we were looking at was just iron hydroxide. It was rust, <clears throat> and it wasn't coming from the water. It was coming from one of the electrodes, from the iron electrode, because he was performing an experiment called electrolysis. <clears throat> but still, I wanted to see where this was heading. So he digs into his briefcase once more and takes out a filter. He attaches the filter to the tap, and he takes a glass of water again that has passed through the filter. And he says, let's do this experiment again. And he does it. He sticks the electrodes uh, in there once more. And we wait and we wait and we wait. And nothing happens. So the message, according to him, was clear. When the water did not pass through the filter, the toxins appeared. After the filter, the toxins didn't appear. So therefore, the filter did the job. Very, very compelling argument. But now I thought, there was a need for a little chemistry lesson. So I said, look, let me just sprinkle a touch of salt into this water. And now you put your electrodes back in and let's see what happens. And he did that, put the electrodes back in. And of course the scum formed once more. And he couldn't understand how on earth this happened, how that small amount of salt could form all of these toxins. Well, I had to explain this to him, but first I thought maybe a more dramatic demonstration would be in order. So I picked up this scummy solution and I drank it. He looked at me, his face turned roughly the color of the scum. He couldn't believe that anyone would do such a foolhardy thing. Of course, I wasn't doing a foolhardy thing. I knew that at most I was giving myself an iron supplement. But now the time came to try to explain to him what on earth was going on here. So I started by uh, asking him a question, whether or not when he had been in high school, he had ever performed the experiment called electrolysis. Well, he was very vague about that. I don't think he, he ever had. So I said, listen, 
People generally think that water conducts electricity, but actually that is not true. Water only conducts electricity when there's a small amount of some ionic material dissolved in it. And then I said, look, there's an experiment that we classically do in the laboratory called electrolysis. It's very simple. You take water and you pass current through the water. And when you have electrodes in the water, one iron, the other one can be another metal, uh, the oxygen that forms reacts with the iron and forms rust. But this only happens when there is a vehicle to conduct electricity in the water, such as ions of sodium or, or, or chloride. So what happened with his filter is that it was actually a very good filter and it removed the ionic strength of the solution and therefore the water did not conduct electricity. That's why you did not get the scum. But in his mind, of course, it all made sense. He didn't have a chemistry background and he saw that this happened with the unfiltered water, it didn't happen with the filtered water and therefore the conclusion was, uh, was obvious. Anyway, now I surprised him once more because I bought a filter. Not because of this demonstration, of course, but because I had been looking for a filter that would remove the residual chlorine taste in water, and the filter did this. It was a pretty good filter. So anyway, this poor confused man walked out of my house, staggered, more or less, and I watched through the window. He opened the trunk of his car, and he put his briefcase in, and then he leaned against the car, and he lit up a smoke. This gentleman who was so worried about the toxins in my water didn't realize that he was inhaling all kinds of horrific toxins from that cigarette. Well, it's an interesting little story. And uh, of course, uh, to the gentleman, this all made sense because he didn't have the appropriate background. And there was nothing wrong with the filter that he was selling. However, this is a different story. This is exactly the same technology. But this gizmo costs six to seven hundred dollars. You put your feet in it, and the claim is that it removes toxins from the body, it improves circulation, removes fatigue, <clears throat> and as you can see, makes your arthritis better, improves kidney function, liver function. So they're not talking about the common cold, they're talking about serious diseases. So you get this thing, you put water in it, and you put your feet in it, and you plug it in, and you wait. And within a short time, this is what you see. The message, of course, being that these are the toxins that are being removed from the body. This is total nonsense. We're seeing the same chemistry experiment that I just explained. Uh, when you put your feet in there, your feet have all kinds of ions on them. You're sweating, and that enhances the electrical conductivity of water. And uh, we get formation of uh, iron oxide because one of the electrodes in here is, is iron. Now, interestingly enough, even after I explained this to some people who have this device, they still tell me that it doesn't matter because they feel better after. Well, perhaps so, because the mind has uh, quite an influence over the body, but this is just an absolute scam. So is this one. This is a more scaled down version, health and beauty water. Well, what is this? What they claim is that they're selling you hydrogen rich water. Now, as I just showed you in the electrolysis experiment, you're forming both oxygen and hydrogen. Here, they're concentrating on, on the hydrogen, claiming that it has all kinds of, of wonderful uh, uh, benefits. Well, this gizmo just does exactly the same thing that I, I described. It's producing uh, hydrogen and oxygen through the process of electrolysis. <clears throat> and when you look closely, indeed, you can see the bubbles of, of the gases. It's totally inconsequential, and you're not going to get any benefit from this. They claim, of course, that when you drink this, you're getting the benefits of hydrogen. Well, hydrogen gas is almost insoluble in water. 1.6 milligrams per liter, that's uh, 1.6 parts per million, that's essentially nothing. So you're not going to get any benefit from uh, the hydrogen, plus, of course, it will never get into your bloodstream anyway. So I think that the, this uh, um, device, uh, produces absolutely nothing in terms of health benefits, but it does leave a bad taste in the mouth. And I would suggest a different kind of packaging for this. I think this would be more appropriate because what we're talking about here is really uh, absolute quackery. Now, the promoters of these things always have some evidence to back it up. 
And here's some evidence about hydrogen being an antioxidant, etc. But none of these papers that they point at have anything to do with the device that they're selling. Uh, but of course, uh, when you kind of make these links and people don't uh, really check it out, you can get away with this kind of silly marketing. Uh, talking about silly marketing, this one maybe takes the cake, the Danish water revitalizer. The manufacturer of this claims that the real problem with our health is that the water we drink cruises through straight water pipes. And when this happens uh, under high pressure, the water sometimes bangs into the 90 degree bends in the pipe and it becomes dead or lazy. Nonsense. But of course, they have just the right device to straighten us out. There it is. You screw this onto your tap. And of course, if you want total fulfillment in terms of health, you put this on your shower. Uh, needless to say, uh, there's absolutely no scientific validity to this. This is total nonsense, as is this. This is another kind of water filter. And the promoters of this tell you in this pseudo-scientific lingo that this vortex water revitalizer uh, all of this, all of these wonderful things, it replaces reverse osmosis systems. Well, this is a dangerous claim because re reverse osmosis is a very legitimate water treatment system. And if anyone has been told that they need to treat their water and they choose reverse osmosis, that, that's fine. But if instead they go for this nonsensical device, it is going to do absolutely nothing. And if you read this uh, little advertisement here, uh, I think you don't have to have much scientific knowledge to realize that this is total uh, gobbledygook. But uh, people worry about the water they drink, and therefore all kinds of water systems sell well. This is the water alkalizer. This uh, will set you back anywhere from three to four thousand dollars. So that is quite an investment. And of course, you get the pseudo scientific promo. They will tell you that Dr. Otto uh, Warburg got, got the Nobel Prize uh, back in the 1930s uh, for studying uh, cancer cells. That much, of course, is, is true. It is also true that he found that cancer cells live in an acidic environment. But this is because that acidic environment is produced by cancer cells. It's not the other way around. It's not acids that produce cancer. Now, in this device, the claim is that when you alkalize your water, you're countering the acidity in your body and therefore countering cancer. Again, we're talking here total fallacy. First of all, uh, whatever you drink or eat is not going to change the level of alkalinity or acidity in your blood. Our blood is a buffered system. It is maintained at a pH of about 7.35. Uh, so any claim that you can change the, the acidity of your uh, blood by eating or drinking something is a fallacious claim. But uh, they, of course, uh, advertise this, uh, that uh, this is going to reduce your risk of getting cancer. And of course, look at all the other diseases that it is supposed to, to treat. The fact is that if you want to drink alkaline water, although there's no reason ever to do that, all you would have to do is to put a spoonful of sodium bicarbonate in a glass of water. You don't need a three to four thousand dollar device to produce alkaline water. But the science behind this is non-existent. Now, this is uh, the kind of problems that we deal with in chemistry. And when you have some sound chemical knowledge, of course, you see right through the, this kind of, of gimmickry. On the other hand, if, if you're not well versed in, in uh, uh, the basics of chemistry, it's very easy to be impaled on nonsense uh, because some of the pseudoscientific mumbo jumbo sounds very, very uh, credible. Now, when uh, we start talking chemistry, I know a lot of you out there want to throw up your hands and get scared uh, because it takes you back to some horror filled class in, in high school which to me is very troublesome because chemistry should never be horrific. It is so easy to make it interesting to, to teach it properly, but much too often that just uh, doesn't happen. And that's what people have the wrong idea of, uh, about chemistry. They think that chemists are these evil creatures locked up in some lab somewhere, just thinking about what new cancer causing additive to unleash on an unsuspecting public. In fact, they may even think that we are a different breed uh, altogether. 
Where does this come from? Because you go into a bookstore these days and this is the kind of book that you find. It's all about toxins, the hazardous chemistry of everyday things. People are worried about endocrine disruptors. They're worried about various kinds of, of toxins without really understanding what it is all about. And they get the impression that chemistry is the, the work of the, of the devil. And this, unfortunately, is what we have to deal with. Now, the truth is that there are skeletons in the chemistry closet. Because until the last couple of decades, the chemical industry didn't pay as much attention to pollution as it should have, uh, didn't pay as much attention to what we call green chemistry using the safest and the best materials. But things are different today. The chemical industry has cleaned up its act and uh, things are done properly. That's why I think that chemistry should be in the limelight because it is the basic science that ties all the other sciences together. If you have a good understanding of what molecules are all, are all about, you have a feel for what can and cannot happen uh, in the world. There are no good or bad chemicals. There are only safe and dangerous ways to use them. So I wanted to emphasize this idea uh, for you that the term chemical should not be a synonym for toxin. Everything in the world is made of chemicals. And uh, the only way that we know of any hazard is by studying chemicals specifically. This is sort of the theme of our office at McGill, uh, which now is over 20 years old and was uh, mandated to separate sense from nonsense, uh, fact from fiction, myth from reality. That's what we do. And as you can imagine, in this era of fake news, uh, our task is uh, getting to be uh, more and more challenging. We have no conflict of interest. We do not accept any kind of money from any vested source. So it makes no difference to me or to my colleagues whether any cosmetic or food additive or medication is regulated or not. The only thing that matters is that whatever decision is arrived at is arrived at based on proper scientific methodology, not on hearsay and not on, uh, on emotion. And uh, we started out, as I said, about 20 uh, years ago, and uh, with the, uh, uh, the challenge of making sure that even when our students pass out through the erotic gates and engage in the real world, that they still have some place where they can come and address questions, because questions indeed do arise. And if there is no proper place where they can uh, pose their questions, they will end up listening to whoever is standing on top of the tallest soapbox, screaming the loudest. And unfortunately, those tend to be the quacks. And these days, they may not be so easy to recognize because they have learned to dress themselves in the cloak of science. They have learned to spout pseudoscientific lingo. And they're out there with their colorful language, telling people that there are simple solutions to complex problems. Well, unfortunately, we live in a very complex world and there are no simple solutions. So our task is to try to demystify science, to keep people up to date on what is happening in the world of science. We hope to foster critical thinking, separate sense from nonsense, if all goes well, keep people out of the clutches of charlatans. But when we first started out on this venture, I thought we needed a logo. And I suggested this one to the university. No, we're not against eating meat. What we're against is uh, this commodity, which is being piled higher and deeper, harder and harder to dig out from under it. Well, McGill didn't go for this logo, but I, I think that it very well represents what it is that we try to do, because the nonsense is everywhere. You can go to your local health food store and buy some aerobic oxygen. I don't know where you would go to buy anaerobic oxygen, but you buy your aerobic variety here. And the salesperson, who now will be dressed in a white lab coat, but the week before may have been mopping floors at McDonald's, uh, will now tell you that uh, the reason we have so many health problems today is because the oxygen content of the atmosphere is decreasing due to pollution, and we have to supplement our oxygen intake and you put a few drops of this aerobic oxygen in a glass of water and that will do it. Uh, total nonsense, of course. 
First of all, we do not breathe through our gut, we breathe through our nose. So even if you put oxygen into your stomach, it wouldn't do any good. And the oxygen content of the atmosphere is not decreasing, it's been steady for millennia. Uh, this aerobic oxygen thing has a smidgen of a chemical that can release oxygen, but there's more oxygen that you inhale in one breath than this can release from the whole bottle. So this is nothing, this is total gimmickry. And yet people will do this, put a couple of drops and drink it and tell you how much better they feel after. That of course is pure psychology. That's the so-called placebo effect. And what is interesting is that, you know, after you've been told about the need for all of this extra oxygen to keep ourselves healthy, you wander over to the next aisle where they sell you antioxidants. The idea that you have to neutralize the devastating properties of oxygen because it can lead to free radicals in the body and they do not recognize the irony of, of this. The trouble is that with the total lack of, of, of good science education, you can sell people almost on anything, including dehydrated water. Well, to tell you the truth, although I'm sure this could be sold as real, it is actually a joke item. Uh, but this is, is also obviously a joke item. Uh, and there's a lot of humor to be you know, had in, in this kind of, of pseudoscience. But uh, fighting all of this is very difficult because it is easy to make a claim. It is much, much harder to, to show that it is nonsense. But that is the task that, that we have. And unfortunately, these days, uh, there's a tsunami of quackery uh, out there, and we're in danger of being flooded by it. Uh, with coronavirus, of course, uh, the quacks have really emerged. Pastor Jim Baker is selling a silver solution to, to do this. This uh, Iranian gentleman uh, has uh, another method to try to stop the coronavirus. Of course, this is total nonsense. And uh, in India, uh, and here as well, Homeopaths claim that they have the answer. Now, homeopathy is the most absurd of all the alternative practices because it is based on the idea that non-existent molecules can produce an existing effect. And in this case, they claim that uh, this arsenicum album, that is a dilute solution of arsenic, so dilute that there's no arsenic left in it, uh, that this is a treatment for coronavirus. Uh, total nonsense, of course. When you take a look at homeopathic preparations, uh, the dilutions are such that by the time that you have taken one drop, diluted it with 99 drops of water and taken one drop of that, diluted with 99, by the time that you've done this 12 times, there's not a single molecule of the original left. So what you are taking in is essentially just water. And water does not have curative properties, of course, unless you think that it has. And uh, there are all kinds of, of homeopathic remedies out there where this water that contains nothing has been soaked into little pellets of sugar. And this is supposed to be a treatment for all kinds of diseases. And when you're using arsenic, uh, then of course it is for uh, coronavirus. Some of these homeopathic remedies are really outrageous, such as homeopathic x-ray. Now, I don't know how one dilutes an x-ray, uh, but they will tell you that this homeopathic x-ray relieves itching or skin rash that is aggravated at night and in bed. So look how specific they are. This works only for the rash at night and in, in bed. How can they get away with this, which they have been doing now for over 200 years? Because of the power of the mind. The placebo effect is a very, very strong effect. And if you believe that something is going to do you good, 30 to 40% of the time, you will feel better. But it's also very important to point out that feeling better is not the same thing as being better. The placebo doesn't cure anything. It just changes your perception of the disease. So what we really need to do is fight scientific illiteracy uh, because it's everywhere. Uh, this brochure was put into my mailbox. It was actually an ad for a type of underwear. It's actually pretty good underwear uh, made of uh, polypropylene. It allows the skin to breathe. But let's take a look, a careful, closer look at the advertising. H2O, also known as sweat, is attracted to thermoskins like Antso Picnic, where constant comfort process separates the H2 from the O, 
making evaporation take place much faster. Let's for a moment deal with the, the graphic artist who thinks that there's a covalent bond between the hydrogens on water, but never mind that. Notice what is happening here as the water passes through the underwear. It gets broken down into oxygen and hydrogen. This underwear is, is performing electrolysis. What a wonderful underwear this is. If this would really work, we'd have a solution to the energy crisis because hydrogen is a great fuel. All we would have to do is to wear the right kind of underwear, produce all the hydrogen the world needs. Needless to say, this is total nonsense. Although the underwear uh, does actually allow moisture to pass through, so it's pretty good underwear, but it does not break the water down into hydrogen and, uh, and oxygen. Well, I've been dealing with this kind of stuff now for a scary long time. In fact, uh, uh, this summer, celebrating 40 years of being on CJAD, uh, answering people's questions mostly about chemistry. That's a long time, as is painfully obvious. Of course, it's only obvious because you see the uh, dial telephone in the picture. Everything else looks the same. So I don't remember 40 years ago the very first question I was asked, but I remember the second question I was asked because it was a stunner. I thought I heard the caller ask this rather remarkable query. It stunned me for a moment. Uh, I didn't know what to, to make of this, but luckily the caller realized quickly that he has forgotten a very important word. He has forgotten golf. As I was to learn, golfers sometimes before hitting the ball, pick it up and kiss it. And this gentleman knew that uh, various kinds of pesticides were used on golf courses. And he was wondering whether or not when he picked up that golf ball to kiss it, obviously for superstitious reasons, whether or not he would be transferring any of the chemicals to his mouth. It's not a totally uh, illogical question because there are some substances that are toxic in very small amounts. So we talked about this, we talked about some of the chemicals that are used. And I said, look, the chance that you transferred a, a, a significant amount to your lips like this is very small. But I also said, listen, there are better things in life to go around kissing than golf balls. I'm not sure whether or not he took that advice. But what was interesting here is that right from the beginning, the kind of questions that I got asked with people understanding that I was a chemistry professor uh, was always, is this safe? Is this toxic? Is this dangerous? That's what they associated chemistry with. And those are still the kind of questions that, that come up today. Is, is uh, uh, polyphosphate a chemical? Well, as soon as I hear that, I know the question that is being asked. What they're really asking is, is this dangerous? Because to so many people, the word chemical is identical to toxin, to poison, and to, to danger. And chemists are these evil creatures who are cooking up these chemicals uh, to do mischievous things with in the lab. Well, it turned out that my caller in this particular case had been using a cleaning agent called Hertel Plus, which actually is a pretty good uh, uh, cleaning agent. And these days, of course, cleaning agents are selling really well. Uh, because everyone is meticulously wiping every surface uh, to prevent uh, infection with the uh, uh, coronavirus, which is, of course, a, it's a, a smart thing to do. Anyway, she had been reading the list of ingredients here and came across sodium tripolyphosphate. And she wanted to know if this was a chemical. Well, I explained to her that, yes, of course, it's a chemical. Everything in the world is made up of chemicals, and they're not good or bad. It just depends on what they are and how we use them. And I said that in this case, this phosphate is added to, to the uh, product because it, uh, it will tie up uh, minerals in water that would interfere with the activity of the cleaning agent. And uh, I guess she bought that because if you expect to find chemicals somewhere, you expect them in cleaning agents. That's okay. She called me back again two weeks later, panic in her voice. I recognized her voice. She had once again encountered sodium tripolyphosphate, but this time on a different label. This time on a label that I suspect many of you recognize because this is the most popular item that is sold in North American grocery stores. And this is Kraft Dinner. This time she was really perturbed and she asked me, what is a cleaning agent doing in here? She says, 
I give my son crab dinner every day, which apparently was not a problem. Uh, what is a cleaning agent doing in there? So I said, look, this is really a multi-talented chemical. Uh, in this case, what it is doing is enhancing the water penetration into your macaroni so that you can cook it more quickly. So that when your son starts to clamor for his daily allotment of crab dinner, you can deliver the goods as rapidly as possible. And I also said, listen, the amount of phosphate is insignificant. You take one bite of meat, you're getting more natural occurring phosphate than you would get in a dozen boxes of crab dinner. I don't think she was convinced uh, because now there was a chemical in her food and she thought that maybe the craft company knowing that eating their product was messy had found a way to clean the kit from the inside out and was adding a cleaning agent. This is the kind of bizarre ideas that, that people get. And they get them from books like this, uh, Consumer's Dictionary of Food Addicts by Ruth Winter. I don't know this lady except as a writer, but I can tell you that she has no business writing such a book. How do I dare say such a uh, potentially libelous uh, statement? Well, I, I think the chance that she's watching this webinar is a uh, very small chance. And furthermore, we are not in the US. And in Canada, these kind of frivolous lawsuits just don't go anywhere. I say frivolous because it's very easy to back up my claim that she has no business writing a book on food additives with the knowledge that she has. Let me do that for you. If my phosphate-fearing friend looked up in this book, she would find shampoos, cuticle softeners, bubble baths, water softening, all of that matches with what I've said, cleaning product. But looking further down, also in incendiary bombs and in tracer bullets. So now she would not only worry about her kid being cleaned from the inside out, she'd worry about him perhaps bursting into flame and uh, exploding, but uh, not without a trace. Of course, she makes the most fundamental of all chemical errors here, confusing phosphate with phosphorus. Phosphorus is the element, and indeed it can be used to make incendiary bombs and tracer bullets, but when you join it up with oxygen to get phosphate, you have a completely different material. The same way that hydrogen, of course, is an explosive gas, but when you mix it with oxygen, you get water, and it has totally different uh, uh, properties. But these are the kind of books that are out there, and people are getting misinformed. And it's difficult, admittedly. Uh, it's puzzling, because uh, you do need to have some you know, basic chemical knowledge to see through all, the, all of this, this kind of, uh, of silliness. And then there's the problem of, of, of the uh, back and forth, information that seems correct one day, not the next. One day we're told butter is great, it's killing us. So we should be eating margarine. But then we find out that it's actually margarine that kills us because it has the trans fats and it goes back and forth like this. Uh, we're told, go out and eat as many fish as you can. Fish are full of omega-3 fats. Omega-3 fats are great. They reduce the risk of cardiac irregularities. You give it to pregnant women, they give birth to babies with higher IQs, all good. And then you find out from some other source that the fish can be contaminated with mercury or with PCBs. So you say, whoa, I, I can't have that. So you start to stay away from, from fish. And on and on it goes, your tap water. Well, tap water, of course, has to be chlorinated to make sure that there are no disease-causing organisms in there. And then you find out that when you use chlorine, it reacts in the water to form compounds called trihalomethanes, uh, and these are carcinogens, so you can't have that. And you don't want chlorinated water, so you buy water in these large jugs, put them on top of a drinking fountain, you find out that no, it's not chlorinated, but uh, uh, the plastic that is used here is poly polycarbonate, which is leaching bisphenol A, and bisphenol A is an endocrine disruptor. And there are some concerns about that, so you say, I don't want this, why can't I just drink from these single serving water bottles? That's not made of polycarbonate. There's no bisphenol A, and the water in there is not chlorinated. It's highly purified, comes from some sort of spring source. But then we learned that in order to make this plastic, which is a polyester, 
we use antimony chloride as a catalyst. And for those of you who remember your high school chemistry, you'll find that antimony is in the same chemical family as arsenic, and arsenic is highly toxic. So therefore, you say, okay, I can't have this, this water uh, either. And you can make yourself crazy worrying. In science, we measure things. We're always working with numbers. So yes, there's arsenic, trace of arsenic present in the water, as I said. But the question that you want to ask is how much, and how does that compare to what we know may be a toxic amount? We know this. We can study it because we can measure things. We know numbers in science. Everything revolves around numbers. And it turns out that that polyester that is used in the uh, water bottles does indeed uh, contain some small amounts of arsenic and, and antimony. Antimony is an issue here too because antimony is uh, uh, used as a catalyst. But the amounts are so small, three parts per billion. But small amounts, of course, can still be significant. You have to compare it to what is known to be toxic. So for example, here, we know that about six parts per billion is the acceptable daily intake. If you take that in every single day for the rest of your life, no problem. And what you find in here in the, in the water is only three parts per billion. So there is really not an issue. So as soon as you hear anything about toxicity or poisons, the question that you have to ask is, is how much is there? How does it compare to known toxic doses? Because as Paracelsus told us 500 years ago, only the dose makes the poison. You cannot determine whether or not anything is dangerous until you know to how much we are exposed. Even with an apple, I can paint a terrible picture for you without talking about numbers. Let me point it out. I think most of us would agree that eating an apple is a healthy thing. What are we eating? This is what we're eating. These are not pesticide residues, they're not additives. These are the building blocks of that apple. That's what it's made of. One of those is acetone. Last time you saw that was probably on the label of your nail polish remover, right above where it says, do not drink. Good advice, because acetone can be toxic. We also have some formaldehyde there. That's the stuff that is used by embalmers to preserve bodies. Formaldehyde is a known carcinogen, it can kill you. So I, I certainly could tell you that, did you know you're eating an apple? It contains acetone, the acetone can kill you, but luckily it also contains formaldehyde, so you will be pre-embalmed. Well, that can rub you the wrong way, and there's some rubbing alcohol, 2-propanol, in there as well. But of course, the amount is so small that it is totally inconsequential. So no, that apple is not taking a bite out of us. That apple is very safe to eat, and the more fruits and vegetables we eat, the better, even though they contain small amounts of toxic substances. So we should encourage people to eat apples. We are exposed to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different chemicals every day. Our world is made up of, of chemicals. There are about 134 million known chemicals listed in chemical abstracts. 99.9% .9 of these, of course, are natural. But those are not the ones that get the press. It's the synthetic chemicals that get, that get the press. There are far more naturally occurring toxic materials than there are synthetic toxic materials. But there's no question that, that we are exposed to a lot of chemicals. When you eat a simple lunch, hundreds of different compounds are the components here. And they, of course, go into our body. So we are basically a, a, a container for chemicals. Our breath, as you can see, 872 compounds, including some coronavirus, saliva, blood, all of these hundreds of different uh, compounds. Our, our coffee that we drink, well, over a thousand different compounds have been isolated from coffee aroma. Over a thousand, that's a lot of compounds. Many of these have been identified. We know exactly what they are as some of them are known cancer-causing agents, things like benzene, formaldehyde, acrylamide. But of course, we also know that coffee does not cause cancer. If it did, we would know. Enough people drink enough coffee around the world. So why not? Because the amounts are so small, 
Plus, of course, coffee also contains other materials, some antioxidants that can mitigate the effect of these uh, potential car carcinogens. So chemicals are everywhere. Our urine contains over 3,000 different compounds. And we can tell a lot about what we are exposed to just by taking a look at our urine. For example, uh, if you eat a lot of canned food, you'll have a higher concentration of bisphenol A because that leaches out from the epoxy lining of the cans. We know this. It doesn't mean that this is dangerous. The amounts are extremely small, but this is how we can monitor to what we are exposed. Today, luckily, we have very sophisticated instrumentation, so we can measure exposures. We can measure what we are exposed to in extremely small amounts with our gas chromatographs or mass spectrometers. We no longer say that we can find a needle in a haystack. Believe it or not, we can find a needle in a world full of haystacks. We can find substances down to a concentration of one part per trillion. That's the width of a playing card in the distance between the Earth and the Moon. Unbelievable. We can find that. But just because we can find it, doesn't mean that it is doing harm. Doesn't mean that it's risky. We have to know how much. And our life is full of risks. This is true. There's no way that we can get away from this. You can be out for a casual walk and uh, terrible things can happen. Oh, don't worry, we're nice people, we don't do awful things, we faked it, they're fine. But they are not the innocent little creatures that you think that they are. There's a risk absolutely everywhere. And some risks people are willing to take, some not. What do you mean by that? When people know that they are taking a risk, they don't have that much trouble with it. What really worries them are risks that are imposed on them, such as the traces of bisphenol A in that canned food, the traces of antimony in the water. These are things that you can't control. And those are the kind of things that people are, are really worried about, especially when they don't take numbers into account. What we always have to do, whether it comes to any food, any beverage, any activity, we have to weigh the risks against the benefits. But it is not always an easy thing to do. Because sometimes when you make a change of one chemical for another, you may be going from the frying pan into the fire. So when we make a decision that we're going to replace, let's say, bisphenol A in, in plastics by some other uh, substance, we have to make sure that uh, the devil that we no, is worse than the devil that we don't yet know. And uh, that isn't always so easy to find out. Uh, so we have to be very careful. You know, there's all the clamoring to replace this, to replace that. We have to make sure that the replacement is safer than what we are uh, replacing. But again, you know, I keep emphasizing that whenever we talk about risk, you have to put it into context. You have to know numbers. You have to know how much we are exposed to and at what level that substance becomes worrisome. Now, there are some risks, of course, that are avoidable, obviously. Uh, if you wear a seatbelt, uh, you're doing the right thing. When you wear a mask these days, uh, you are doing a good thing. So there, there, you know, there are some risks that, that are avoidable, but they're not all avoidable. But just because a chemical is present does not mean that it presents a risk. We have to do a lot more investigation before we can conclude that there is some risk. And furthermore, whatever the effect of a substance has on the body depends on what that substance is. It depends on the molecular structure, not on whether it is synthetic or natural. The history of a molecule does not determine its efficacy or its safety. Uh, this term natural, which is bandied about all the time these days, first of all, has no legal definition. But the implication is that if something is natural, it is inherently better. Well, the most dangerous toxins in the world are natural. Rattlesnake venom, scorpion venom, ricin from, from the cast, castor bean, uh, botulin. These are all perfectly natural. So 
whether or not a substance is dangerous or not has nothing to do with whether it's synthetic or natural. And humans are not giant rodents. Uh, you have to remember that a lot of toxicity studies that are done are done on mice and our rats. And the human is not a giant rat, with some exceptions, obviously. So it's always difficult to come to a conclusion based upon a rodent experiment. But, uh, but this is um, inherent in toxicology because we cannot do experiments on human subjects. So we do have to evaluate based upon test animals. We also have to remember, and this is a very important point, that children are not small adults. And a substance that may be perfectly harmless in an adult may be quite dangerous in a child. And uh, one of the first things that you know, teach uh, medical students is, is this, that, that uh, you have to, to treat children totally different from adults. And uh, a small amount of a toxin may throw a wrench into the nervous system when it is forming, but may be quite all right when the nervous system is already totally uh, formed. And although, as I said, we do use animal models, uh, of course, to determine safety and, and uh, efficacy, the problem is that the animals are not such great models because even closely related animals will behave differently. Dioxin, one of the most toxic substances that we know, it's never produced on purpose, it's always a byproduct of the industrial process, it's extremely toxic if you're a guinea pig. But if you're a hamster, closely rated animal, you can frolic in it. So how do we conclude anything about the toxicity of dioxin for humans? Obviously, it becomes very challenging. Chocolate, think about this for a moment. Imagine that there were no chocolate. I, no, it's a horrific thought, but nevertheless, think about this. And imagine someone has just discovered a way to make chocolate, to take the cocoa beans and then make it into this wonderful product. But it's not yet on the market, so you would have to test it for safety. And imagine that they decided to test it on dogs. Well, we would never have chocolate because chocolate contains theobromine, chemical uh, that is toxic to dogs. We can very happily eat it. It is not toxic to humans. So some of these toxins are very species specific and we're okay. We can eat all the chocolate that we want without any problem, except of course, concerning the sugar content in there and then the weight that might ensue. But there's no toxicity in the, in the chocolate. We cannot, of course, avoid all risk, no matter what we do. We can never prove that there's no risk associated with the chemical because you can never test it on everyone in the world. So there's always the chance that someone will have a, a reaction to it. We have to live with this degree of uncertainty. And uh, science is an uncertain, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a journey. It's a journey towards a finish line where the finish line always kind of subtly keeps going away, away from you. We can never totally avoid our risk. We also have to understand that there are opposing views in science all the time. People will disagree. There are scientists who don't agree on climate change. However, there's always more weight on one side of this balance than on the other. We cannot assume that opposing views have equal merit because in virtually all such situations, one side has a lot more scientific evidence to back it up than does the other. But very often, the minority side tends to have very good speakers who can make for very compelling arguments. You can cherry pick data. Each of these studies here uh, has been carried out to see whether or not the food that we're talking about reduces the risk of cancer. Now notice, large number of studies, but in many such cases, some studies show a positive effect, some show negative. Believe it or not, although most studies of tomatoes show that it has anti-cancer properties, there are also a few that show that it causes cancer, probably at some high dose in some species of animals. Note that the only one here where there's uh, no corroborative health benefit is bacon. All the studies about bacon show that it is unhealthy food, and yet it is probably the fastest growing food in, in North America. So we cannot cherry pick. You can't just take one study and talk about it. You have to, to look at it all. 
cherry picking is one of the most dangerous things to do that, that people who are not well versed in science do. They will pick up one study and come to some sort of conclusion. What we have to do is shake that cherry tree, mash all those cherries together, and then taste it and come to some sort of conclusion. The plural of anecdote is not data. Just because your neighbor got better by taking some homeopathic remedy doesn't mean that the therapy worked. The only way that we come to some conclusion is, is by doing proper randomized controlled double-blind studies, which unfortunately are difficult and expensive to do. But no matter what we do, we cannot predict all the consequences of our actions. Who could have predicted back in the 1930s when we switched to Freon from sulfur dioxide in refrigerators, because sulfur dioxide was unsafe. If you had a leak, you could die in your kitchen. Who could have predicted at that time that 50 years later, Freons would be found in the upper atmosphere, destroying the ozone layer? No way that anyone could have predicted that. These days though, uh, I think we are getting better at predicting. Correlation is not the same as causation. This is critical to understand. For example, there are people out there today saying that there's an increase in autism, which indeed is true, and they show you this graph where the increase in autism paralleled the increase in glyphosate, that's Roundup, uh, a wheat killer, urging people to come to the conclusion that glyphosate causes autism. A correlation can never prove cause and effect. I could also show you a correlation between autism and sales of organic food. They have increased in parallel. Of course, it doesn't mean that organic foods cause autism. So you have to be very careful at interpreting the numbers. You have to seek out the numbers, but you have to be careful in interpreting them. And these days, we are getting much better at making predictions, at knowing what to do, practicing green chemistry, using chemicals that we know are the safest, carrying out chemical reactions that have the highest yields, fewest uh, byproducts. And we must be doing something right because the overall cancer rate is steady. There's no cancer epidemic. It's not increasing. Average life expectancy is increasing. So we're doing some things right. Now, this is not to say that we should be out there cheerleading for chemicals. That's not the point. Chemicals are not good or bad. They are just things. It all depends on how we use them. They're not to be feared. They're not to be worshipped. They are to be understood. And uh, these days, even that is getting to be difficult because it's hard to get a good chemistry set to start teaching kids. This one here, believe it or not, advertises no chemicals required. Just goes to show you how we have fallen into the pit of nonsense where uh, you don't get chemicals with a chemistry set because they are thought to be uh, toxic. So we've got to think chemically. Of course we do because everything in the world is made of chemicals and uh, we have to know how they react. We have to know about toxicity. And uh, I've always thought, as I, I, I told you, that chemists are the right people to ask about these things because uh, molecules are the base of everything. And if you have a feel for how they can react, you can give some pretty good judgments. Uh, and uh, sometimes though, when you, you feel you, you've got a handle on things and that people are listening to you, uh, something comes up. My latest book is A Grain of Salt. And when it came out, the publisher calls me and says, you know, you made it onto the bestseller list. So I thought that's great. And I look at the bestseller list and sure enough, uh, there I am uh, at number nine. I was happy. And then I start looking at this list and I see what is on top of me. For example, uh, Anthony Williams' uh, celery juice diet. Uh, this is a guy who calls himself the medical medium. He gets his scientific advice from a spirit and uh, celery juice is his cure for everything. So there's a, a lot of nonsense out there. And uh, hopefully we can counter it with a lot of sense, but sometimes it does seem to be overwhelming. Anyway, I hope I've given you a bit of an idea of the kind of challenges that we have in separating sense from, uh, from nonsense. And if you're further interested, there's a lot of info on our website, which is mcgill.caoss. And uh, we also have a newsletter to which you can subscribe. It's free, of course, and it appears every Saturday morning, 6 a.m. in your uh, inbox. And uh, 
remember that next time that you see something like this, DHMO kills, and you start reading uh, about uh, all of the dangers, uh, just remember that uh, if you had studied some chemistry, you would know that uh, DHMO uh, stands for something called dihydrogen monoxide, which is just water, nothing to worry about. Even though everything they say about the dangers is true, leads to soil erosion, leads to uh, uh, corrosion, uh, loads to bloating and nausea, can short circuit electricity, uh, it's found in every cancer cell. All of that is true, but it's just good old H2O. So thanks very much for your attention. And uh, if there are any questions that have arisen, uh, we can try to answer them. Thank you so much, Dr. Joe, for your talk. It was really interesting to discover the importance of separating sense from nonsense when it comes to scientific matters, such as uh, differentiating chemicals from toxins and the challenges involved, and how surrounded we really are by this nonsense. So as we have a couple minutes left, we'll take a few questions from the audience. So we'll start with the first. What is a science method or human wishful thinking that you feel just won't go away in the field or that you feel that holds science back? Uh, well, if we want to talk specifics, I mean, uh, as I, I suggested, the most absurd is uh, in the health areas is homeopathy, which is also quite popular. But the idea that that uh, solution that contains nothing can cure uh, is 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 beyond absurd. So uh, yeah, I think that that holds science back. Uh, something else that holds science back is is uh, these days is you know all of the this publicity that is given to, to conspiracy ideas you know that that uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, are not really interested in curing cancer for example because they're making too much money from treating cancer i mean this is just not true and uh, but this this kind of idea is out there that that scientists are not working to the uh, sort of to the advancement of humanity, that the only thing that they're interested in is how to make a, a dollar. And uh, it's not true. Uh, you know, it's, uh, pharmaceutical companies are working very hard in order to try to find treatments for all diseases. And there's no conspiracy to, to keep known cures out of the hands of people. This doesn't mean, of course, that pharmaceutical companies are, are all choir boys, right? I mean, there are a lot of financial issues there and, and uh, you know, the money that is being charged for some medications, but that's a different story. The science there is, is sound, but the conspiracy theories indeed do hold back the advance of science. Okay, great, thanks. And on, well, you also had mentioned a lot about um, quackeries out there. Um, on that note, how credible do you believe um, shows such as the doctors or Dr. Oz are on them? disseminating the scientific information. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Oz is a real enigma. Uh, he, of course, is a, a legitimate physician. He's a cardiac surgeon and by all accounts, you know, uh, a good one. And uh, when he used to be on with Oprah, when, you know, he first started his, his TV appearances, he was very good. He would talk about broccoli and exercise. And then Oprah appointed him God and gave him his own show. And then he had to fill five hours a week of network TV. Mm -hmm. And then he started to get into the nonsense, the, the uh, miracle weight control products, the, the uh, dietary supplements. And these days, I think that doc, Dr. Oz has become an actor playing the role of Dr. Oz. It's not a science show, and they will tell you it's not a science show. And uh, they basically cater to uh, you know, an audience that is made up of, of middle-aged, generally overweight American women. That's what they cater to. Uh, so I would not put Dr. Oz into the uh, real trustworthy category, uh, but it does not mean that everything that he says is, is nonsense. And this is, this is actually one of the biggest problems when you have a mixture of sense and nonsense, and you have to tease out the sense, which many people are not able to do because you do have to have some scientific background to know which part of it is nonsense and which is not. So it's sometimes it's, it's easier to, to deal with people where you can say that everything that they do is nonsensical rather than ones that have some speckles of sense in there. 
Okay, great. No, that, that actually segues perfect to the next question. What do you believe would be the best approach to increase scientific liter literacy and critical thinking, whether it be through schools or within the general public to become more aware of the nonsense that we interact with in our daily lives? Yes, I, I mean, that, of course, is the perennial question. I, I think we need to do a better job getting kids interested in science early on in elementary school. Because curiosity is to a science, is the science or the spark is to a flame. And if you can generate some curiosity very early on, uh, they will maintain that curiosity. And you don't have to have very sophisticated experiments. You know, simple experiments can be done in elementary schools, you know. And uh, for example, one that I like is, is just uh, asking uh, how many boxes of Smarties or M&Ms do you have to open before you can predict what the color distribution is going to be in the next one. And when you think about that, that is a very real scientific experiment because that is really what we do in so much of science. We do some experiments in order to predict what may happen in a yet unknown situation. And uh, you can teach a lot with something you know, as, as simple as that. Uh, but we need imaginative teachers in elementary school and uh, we need to emphasize more science. Uh, unfortunately, often elementary school teachers themselves are not that well versed in science. And in fact, you know, often that's why they go into elementary school teaching is because they don't want to go into science. But that's, that's where we need to capture the kids' attention. From earlier stages, which I, essentially will help the misinformation or stop misinformation as they grow older. Um, and then on another, uh, we'll do our last question. Why do you think health food stores um, or you know general products are, uh, that we encounter every day um, are permitted to sell these items that are not what they are represented to be? Good, good question. Uh, the legality of selling these things in in, in Canada, uh, the Natural Products Division of, of Health Canada controls the dietary supplements, but they control it very loosely as long as something isn't overtly dangerous basically unless they make an outrageous claim on the product itself they let it go so you know the as long as that homeopathic remedy doesn't say on the bottle will cure cancer uh they they kind of look the other way because they don't have enough manpower uh to uh, go after all of the dietary supplements there are thousands of these that have you know very questionable uh, evidence and as long as uh, there's no overt danger uh, they don't do anything about it I, I i think that there should be much much stronger regulation uh, ours is a little bit better than the u.s in the u.s almost anything goes it's really the wild west when it comes to dietary uh, supplements and uh, this is not to say that uh, Health Canada doesn't go after some, sometimes they do, but you know, it's so overwhelming. It's, it's like putting your finger in the dike to close up that hole and immediately sprouts elsewhere. You close down one website that has been promoting some quack cancer remedy. The next day they're back with some other name on another website. So uh, the internet is almost impossible to police. Yeah, which falls suit with the challenges that we face. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Joe. That was a very interesting topic to dive into. Um, thank you everyone as well for being here with us today. Uh, Follow-up email will be sent to, with today's recording and will be shared shortly. Don't forget that you can catch Dr. Joe Schwartz and the team from the McGill Office for Science and Society every Thursday on their Facebook page and their YouTube channel. Thanks again. Bye and stay safe, everyone. Thank you.